So we are about 2.15 p.m. on Good Friday, 2022, here in Massachusetts. Our Lord would be hanging on the cross for another 45 minutes. And just think for a moment the, the most excruciating pain you've ever gone through. That should not be hard to remember. But if you ever noticed how slow time passes when you suffer a lot. And our Lord, three hours had to be like an inf infinite infinity of suffering for on His human nature. So let's briefly now contemplate the sufferings of our Lord. Because this is very always very fruitful. It's always good for the soul and for... Uh, for keeping the, our focus towards heaven, how much God so loved us that He truly sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our redemption. It really is the excess of the love of God. And if anything it shouts is the love of God, the tremendous love of God, the excessive love of God. And this was a complaint of our Lord to one of the holy Benedictine nun, he complained and said, "I have died for I died for souls. I love them, and they don't they don't even ask me. They don't ask me for great things. They don't ask me more that I want to give them. And so we should learn from this to ask our Lord great things. And the greatest of all things, of course, is that we love God with all our heart, our whole soul, all our strength, all our mind." This is a great grace, and we have to beg it. And our Lord being <clears throat> so generous, He will give it. He will give it. Ask anything in my name, and my Father will give it to you. And if we add to that from what we know of Our Lady, ask anything of Our Lady, she's going to ask the Divine Son, who will ask the Father. It's an infallible request. But always ask the love of God. So we see here you have two visible, visible sermons, props. Jesus scourged, he's holding here the reed, the reed of mockery, the mock scepter. Isn't this what Joe Biden, isn't this what the, the Klaus Schwab and all these world leaders who want to make their world new great reset without Christ the King, they put us a reed in his hand and mock him. They mock his kingship. And any constitution, any governmental law that rejects Christ the king, they're mocking his kingship. Because it's a fact of human history that God became man. It's a fact of human history that God was born of a virgin and mother. It was, it's a fact of history that this God, our Lord Jesus Christ, founded a church and established seven sacraments, outside of which there is no salvation. It's a fact of history that he died brutally on the cross. And it's a fact of history that he rose from the dead. And it's a fact of history that this Catholic Church we belong to and, and pray to die in has lasted since Christ died on the cross, since his apostles all were martyred for the Holy Catholic faith, for the love of Christ crucified. This Catholic Church has lasted this long when it should have been extinguished in the year 259 under the Roman emperors, easily. If it was a human institution, it would have been extinguished. And then our Lord left his church the guidance of the Holy Ghost. And the popes have infallible authority when they fulfill three conditions. If they don't fulfill these three conditions, they don't have infallibility. And that's why at Vatican II, Pope Paul VI said, we do not invoke infallible authority on this council. Therefore, the Holy, the Holy Ghost was told, well, you're not welcome here. Get lost. We'll handle the world's problems by ourselves. And a lot of good that has done. But the fact that the Catholic Church is going to last and has lasted through persecutions, through attacks of heresies, through betrayals from within, with modernism erupting 
in the late 1800s and condemned under Pius X, and now erupted with a full explosion since Vatican II. How is the church going to get out of this? She's reduced to ashes almost. And we have a pope who's swinging the sledgehammer, smashing everything left of tradition. He's now picking on these Carmelite nuns in Pennsylvania. What does he want to do? He wants to dissolve the traditional orders that want to observe the statutes and rules of their founders. And that's, that was the goal of Vatican II, aggiornamento. They have to get in sync with the modern world, which means become worldly, secularized, abandon their habits, and just become social workers. So how is the church going to rise from this when we see so many factions our poor Catholic Church reduced to such rubble and made the mockery of the whole world with the scandals of bishops and priests that have, that have heaped mud of scandal on, on our Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church. I think we're on the verge of one of the greatest proofs of the Catholicity and the divinity of this Holy Roman Catholic Church. We're on the verge of her to triumph again. And the prophecies say she will rise more, more splendorous than in the high ages of the faith. And we're on the verge of this with the, with the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary after a huge chastisement on the world. And how the Catholic Church is going to rise from this, I don't know, but we know she will. She know, we know she will. Because we have the words of our Lord, His promise, the gates of hell will not prevail. He never said how far the gates of hell might get in attacking the Catholic Church or infiltrating her, but it will never succeed. So, our Lord, we turn to Him on this day, on this hour, when He truly was hanging on the cross for us. So, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the morning after He left the dungeon, the Jews cleaned him up because they didn't want to leave evidence of their horrible maltreatment of the Son of God. And they didn't want to get incurred that they were torturing him, which they were. So they cleaned him up, they put on his good garments, and they take him before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, he's wondering what's going on. They're making a big deal about this. And Pontius Pilate sees, he asks, he, he speaks to our Lord. And he realizes this is not some lunatic. You'll notice in the movie of Mel Gibson, he, 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 he has a, an interesting touch, which may have happened, that, that Pontius Pilate speaks in Hebrew to Christ. Who brought you here? What have you done? And Christ answers in perfect Latin, because Pontius Pilate, being a Roman, they, they spoke Latin. So Mel Gibson put that touch, which was a good touch. It's, it's very possible it happened. So Pontius Pilate, uh, I'm not going to go through the details of all the trials, but Pontius Pilate thinks, well, look, I'm just a Roman governor. Your king is Herod. Let Herod handle this. So he, he, he walks, they take our Lord, and he walks He's taken with chains over to Herod. And Herod, of course, he's, he's just filthy. He's, he's, like his, he's like his father who killed all the Hebrew children in Bethlehem. Up to 4,000 children were slaughtered in that massacre. So his son, Herod, is, is wretched. And some of the mystics say he had Christ in front of him and he was very curious and he brought in a dog with three legs, and he said, put another leg on. And all the people laughed in the court. And then some of the mystics say he brought in a, a, a man who was dwarfed and retarded and drooling. And, cry, and, and Herod said, well, you cured many other people. Why don't you give this man intelligence? And they laughed. And then some of the mystics say Herod went even more filthy and more bold and brought in lewd dancers in front of Christ. And Christ, his eyes were just down. He would not answer. 
He will not respond because Christ taught us, don't throw your pearls to swine. There are many souls who seek the truth. Give it to them when they ask questions or ask why you are Catholic and why you have a big family or why you wear a dress or why you... Why don't you cheat in business? Why don't you cuss like the other guys? Why don't you cheat on your wife like the other guys? So when they see this light in you and they ask, give to them. At least give them a website, something that helps them towards Catholic tradition to, the, to our Lord. But there are souls that, and I'm sure you've met them, who mock, who don't want truth. They don't want the truth. They just want to mock and with these, Christ says, you do not throw your pearls to swine. Not that we're saying, I'm better than you, and you don't deserve to hear my words. No, it's not that. It's, we don't deserve to have the Catholic truth either. But you don't give these pearls to those who are going to spit on it and throw it in the mud. And that's what our Lord showed us before Herod. Herod was not interested in the truth. He was just like his father, who told the three kings, Tell me where you find the child, and when you do find him, let me know, because I will come and adore him also. He was lying. He was a liar. He would not have gone, and the proof is the slaughter of the innocents. So this Herod, he has no interest in the truth, and Christ doesn't answer. So you have Samson in the Old Testament. Samson, remember, he was captured, finally, he was a great warrior against the Philistines. He killed many. And when they captured him, they gouged out his eyes so he couldn't see. And they made sport of him. They dressed him in a white garment, which is the garment of a psychiatric ward patient, and mocked him. So Samson, Samson was thrown around, and finally, as we all know, the, the day he was chained to the pillars. And... There was a huge celebration of the Philistines. They invited everybody. I mean, it was a building probably huge, like a several-story shopping mall. And some of the foundations are still found by archaeologists. And it was huge. It was a huge building. So Samson, in the basement with the guards, he said, put me by this pillar. Can I, can I just rest by the pillar? I have to rest myself by the pillar. They said, all right, you can stand by the pillar. They loosened his chains. And he grabbed one pillar... And he grabbed another pillar, and he shook the entire building, and the whole building came crashing down, and he killed more in that day than he did in all his days of battle. Thousands were killed in that one incident of the 9-11 of the days of Samson. And Samson, he prefigures Christ, who will be... Christ will be, care, care, will be the second Samson who will grab the two pillars of the cross and shake down, like Samson, tear down the structure of, the, of Satan. And in Christ's death, he will convert more than he did in the three years of his preaching. So he will conquer the devil that way. So as Samson was put in white and mocked, Christ is dressed as a psychiatric ward patient by Herod. And Herod treats, imagine this, imagine, imagine the angels watching this, because they were. Imagine the archangels and the thrones and cherubim and seraphim, these armies of billions of angels watching the God who they see and adore as he really is, standing and being treated like an absolute idiot and fool by man. And the angels are just... I'm sure there are some angels that they were begging the Father, let me have revenge, let me slice them all in half. Remember, one angel killed 185,000 in one, one battle, in one second. Within minutes, he slaughtered 185,000. One angel. So if the whole army of angels was unleashed, Christ said to Peter on the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, don't you know my Father? I could ask my Father and he can send... Twelve legions of angels. So a legion has about 6,000 men. So 12 legions would be about 72,000 angels. Don't you know my father, could, I could ask my father, he'll send me 72,000 angels and wipe out the human race just like that. But that's not the plan of our Lord. This is not the love of the sacred heart. 
And he, he reminds us this when he told St. John and St. James, the son of thunder, who wanted to call down fire on a city that mistreated our Lord and ignored him. And they said, send fire down on that city, Lord. And Christ said, you don't know what spirit you are. Because the Son of Man came not to condemn, but to save what was lost. And this is our time of mercy, our time on earth, and down to the second coming of Christ is a time of mercy. He wants to save souls. And the proof is what he did. So Herod dresses him in white and sends him back to Pilate. And Pilate, thinking he's appeals, he's going to appeal to the compassion of the Jews who have zero. He has our Lord flogged. Now, just before this, this is what St. Vincent Ferrer says. It's interesting. He says, Claudia, the wife of Pilate, had dreams. The devil, seeing Christ's great patience and the joy of the Holy Fathers in limbo. So the devil's watching all this. He sees Christ's great patience, his suffering, his majesty. He sees the souls in limbo all excited at the redemption, because soon they're going to go into heaven. The devil picks all this up. And, he, and this is what St. Vincent Ferris says, that he inspires the dreams of Claudia. The devil, seeing Christ's great patience and the joy of the Holy Fathers in limbo, and wishing to thwart the passion of Christ, appeared in a dream to Pilate's wife, still in her bed sleeping, so that through the woman's intervention, our redemption might be impeded. She was threatened. She had to persuade her husband, so in no way would he kill that good and just man. Then Pilate, as much out of love for his wife, as also because he knew that they had handed him over out of envy, worked to free Christ, all the while striving to keep the goodwill of the Jews. So Pilate is, again, he's your typical liberal Joe Biden. He's your typical liberal Democrat world leader, our, the modern Democratic leaders. They put truth and error on the same level. He appeals to, Bar he brings up Barabbas and says, look, in your law, you're, you can let loose a prisoner on the Pasch. So he's hoping that they're going to call for, for Christ because Barabbas is a real criminal and he's a real murderer and he deserves capital punishment. So the Jews, influencing the crowds by the media, they persuade the crowd to call for Barabbas. And now Pontius Pilate is in another quandary. So seeking to appeal to their compassion, he has our Lord scourged, brutally scourged. Now, Jim Caviezel, who played the part of Christ in the movie The Passion, open brackets, I know there's a lot of criticism against this movie, but I can say as a priest, when that movie came out, I think it was 2004 or 5, if I'm not mistaken, or 3, 2003 it was. When that came out, I can say as a priest, and I'm sure many other priests could say this, there were many, many penitents come into confession. Father, it's been 70 years since my last confession. 30 years, 40 years, 25 years. And many of them said that movie of the Passion brought me, brought me here. So there was a great grace with that film for the whole world. It was a grace. That's why the synagogue of Satan, they didn't want it out. And even the cowardly novice order bishops, they condemned the movie as not historical. These poor, poor fools. And in Sacramento, I was there at the time in St. Mass in California, and the Bishop of San Jose fired one of the teachers in Sacramento in a Catholic school. He fired the teacher because he, he gave as a homework assignment to the students to watch the film The Passion. So he upset the bishop, and he, the bishop fired him. So... Uh, a lot of good came from this, this film. So, close brackets. So, when Jim Caviezel was playing the part of Christ being whipped, Jim Caviezel said that 
they had chains, they had the links on his wrist, and he was chained to the pillar. And in the filming, they whipped Christ, Jim Caviezel, and they missed. And they actually hit him. And he was, he was knocked out, uh, knocked out cold for a few minutes. They had to revive him with water. And that wasn't the first time. That wasn't the last one. He got hit twice. The second time was more violent. And I think it shows up in the movie where they, they showed the ripping of his skin. And at that point, he, was, he, he pulled his hands right through the chain links. So the skin of his hand was partly torn off. And he was knocked out. It was extremely painful. Just two hits. And the, the Jewish law was 39 hits. But Pilate said, he said to the head, the head soldier in charge of the scourging, give him a little extra. Make it a little extra so the people let him go. He thinks it's going to move them to compassion. And this is a perfect liberal who puts Barabbas and Christ on the same level. The Catholic religion of, of tradition with all the false religions. Separation of church and state is, is a, it's a total success of Satan. And it's a total goal always of, of the Freemasons. Separate church and state, then the church is put away, and the state becomes the God and the final say on everything. And the state can pass laws that offend God, such as abortion and so forth. So our Lord is taken and scourged. And there's no... <laughs> There's no um, board on his back. There's no block. There's a demonstration done by someone who's explaining the scourging, and he has a real whip that, that looked more, more truth, genuinely what, what the Roman whips would have been like. And there were, as you know, there were th three rounds of the scourging. First was with the leather whips. Second with the leather whips with leather tied knots. So the first round tendered his skin, bruised his skin, which was already tender. Remember, he bled in the Garden of Gethsemane, so his flesh was very tender. And when the knots hit, they, went, they, they caused deep, dark, black, purple spots all over his body. And then the third round of whippers was the most brutal. And this is where this, this man who demonstrates the whip, he hits a cardboard box just once, and it just <laughs> it rips a hole deep into it, a cardboard box. And I think in the movie, they, they, they whip a part of the wood, a wooden fence or something. And, and, and so what it does to the flesh, it just rips it, rips it apart. There's no firmness so when our Lord was whipped, the scourging, the, 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 the Shroud of Turin shows he was whipped like this. He was tied up on pulleys, 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 which were tied to the top of the pillar. And he was suspended in, with his feet barely touching the ground. That's how he was whipped. And brutally, front and back. Now the Shroud, the shroud of Turin shows 630 deep gouges in our Lord's body. So, our, our, Saint, our, Lord, our Lady revealed to St. Bridget that our Lord had over 4,400-something 4, wounds. So the shroud would only pick up the deep, deep gouges. So that's not including the bruises, the lighter cuts, and the, light, the lighter <clears throat> wounds. So truly, as Isaiah says, from head to foot, he looked like a leper. He is truly the man of sorrows. And this statue, um, it's, it's a great statue. I really love it. It shows what our Lord suffered, and I'm sure it was even worse than this. Blessed uh, Brother Andre in Montreal, he had a statue of the scourging about that tall. And he gave one to Little Rose in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. She's the one that has the stigmata, the crown of thorns. She died at age 33. She was born in a stable, and she suffered the passion of our Lord. <clears throat> so he would visit her 
and he left her a statue of the scourging. So um, they love to meditate on, on this proof of the love of Christ. The most innocent lamb who never sinned is treated like a criminal. And if you can see in the back, you can see the details of his back. This is just the statue, but you have the chunks of flesh falling off. And that's really what happened. With those, that third round of scourging, the deep, deep wounds caused the flesh to just rip out. Muscles to rip out. So that some of the mystics say that you could count our Lord's ribs. They have numbered, pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. You could count our Lord's ribs on his back. And then, remember, he was naked. So the, scru the scourging on the shroud shows... His bottom is just ripped to pieces and his legs and down to his ankles. And then that includes also the front side, which... So, that's not all. <clears throat> the soldiers have a little fun. And they crown him with thorns. And this is another... Another cause of great suffering. Now this crown is one of the three parts. There's three parts to the crown. First, this. Second was the full helmet that went from the eyebrow to the back of the neck and into the ears. It was a full bush of heavy, sharp thorns. And then another clump on the crown. And then they took clubs and pounded it deep into our Lord's skull. So that the points of the, the thorns embedded themselves deep even into the skull bone. And again, I argue, a normal man would, be, would go unconscious. And if not now, certainly on the way of the cross, our Lord would normally have gone unconscious. Put an NFL football player, an NHL hockey player, through that same beating, they would be probably dead at the scourging, even the strongest. And they certainly would have been knocked out because but our Lord would not be knocked out for the love of souls and he will <clears throat> undergo what is called hypovolemic shock when someone loses too much blood the heart can't pump it through the body anymore so I, I argue that our Lord miraculously stayed alive just like the Virgin Mary such were her sorrows that it was miraculous she could live. And so our Lord would have undergone hypovolemic shock, which means they, they start getting nauseous, like feeling to throw up. They get shivers. They start shaking. They get chills, yet they have a fever. And he has a, a terrible thirst, an unquenchable thirst. And there's accounts of the armies of Alexander the Great they were so thirsty in one going through the desert that they found, they found a lake of water, a pond, and they drank and drank and drank. And some of them, men, a handful of them died. They just died because they kept, they overdrank themselves and they died from it. But that's how, that's how thirsty they were. So what was Christ's thirst when you lose so much blood? You just thirst it's a painful thirst. And by now, Christ has cotton mouth. He has no more saliva in his mouth. And the only thing wetting his mouth is his own blood dripping through the crown of thorns down his face, into his eyes, into his beard. And so the Roman soldiers and the Jews gather around him and blindfold him, punch him in the face. And they say, who hit you? You're a prophet. Who hit you? Was it Marcus? Was it Caius? Was it Lucas? And they had fun just pounding him. And, of course, the crown of thorns, uh, the head wounds bleed profusely. So our Lord was constantly being rained on with his own warm, dripping blood all over his body. And then Christ is taken by Pilate again the third time. Look that you may know that I find no cause in him. I bring him forth to you, says Pilate. 
Jesus therefore came forth bearing the crown of thorns and the purple garment. And Pilate said to them, Ecce homo, behold the man. Which is to say, here is the man who says he is your king. As you allege, it is enough for you that such abominable contempt be laid on this man for this accusation. When the priests and ministers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Which says that punishment was not sufficient. We ask that he be crucified. We want no other death but crucifixion. So there is the influence of the, the media, the powerful media. Most of the populace, I'm sure, were moved to pity. But the influence of the synagogue of Satan got everybody to, to shout for Barabbas and shout for his crucifixion. So according to St. John Chrysostom, crucifixion was so shameful and ignominious, ignominious that one crucified would be remembered only as cursed. And that David bewails, saying, I am poured out like water, Psalm 21, because the smell of every liquid remains in the empty jar except for water. They wanted his name to be forgotten. As St. Thomas says on this text, Therefore they sought that he be crucified. And they wanted to humiliate him terribly by crucifying him between two real criminals. St. Vincent Ferrer, he goes, he's going to bring out some points that I'd like to bring out with you. I have endured much this night because of this holy and just man. Then the devil recognized the fruit of the passion of Jesus Christ from the joy of the souls awaiting in limbo, which from many prophets was, were hoping that they be redeemed. So by this time, the devil realizes this is going to go against him. But he's already got the crowd into a frenzy, and the, it's already been done. The sentence is passed, and Pilate washes his hands like a liberal says he's innocent and condemns him, condemns him to death. So what kind of justice is that? He says, declares him innocent, yet condemns him as a criminal. The sentence of death was issued. Next, says St. Vincent Ferrer, they mocked him. They clothed him in purple and dressed him in a way that would make it more recognizable that he was going to his death. So he would be jeered at all the more. And then, without doubt, Christ experienced a fresh, extreme pain because that purple garment had become encrusted and deeply embedded in the wet wounds of the scourging. It could not be ripped off without excruciating pain. You can imagine, especially when his tunic was torn away, that all his wounds were reopened, and this was a harsher penalty than the scourging itself or even the crowning with thorns. Fresh bleeding began, and his whole body was coated in red. And laying the cross on him, they led him out of the city. So the Jews blocked the way, to the shortcut to Calvary, they, sh they blocked it. So our Lord was forced to go through the streets and by the markets. So as he passed through, they were throwing rotten cabbage, rotten eggs, rotten food at him, and when our Lord fell, they would surround him and just kick him violently until the guards can drive them off. And it is a fact that our Lord, his kidneys were so violently kicked that they stopped working. And that's why the shroud comes out so vividly and so clear because of the uric acid, which is normally purified by the kidneys, they didn't work anymore, so all that came out through his blood and pores and sweat. And hence, the clear image of the shroud. And as our Lord carried the cross up Calvary uh, through the streets, and then finally the Roman soldier, Longinus, and head, who was head of the whole procession, he had enough with the Jews. And he said, cut right through them and push them out of the way if you have to. So they make their way by the Roman guards and clear the way throughout the west, the west side of the Jerusalem, outside the west gate. Now, it was an Old Testament practice that the 
scapegoat would be driven out of the west side of the city walls into the desert to die. And the scapegoat, all the sins of the priests and the people would be laid on that scapegoat. And at the Ankiji tour, the priest does that action. He puts his hands like that over the oblation, as the priest did over the scapegoat and some of the animals and sheep that were sacrificed. They would lay the sins on them. And in, in the Mass, it's called the Epiclesis. This is when the Holy Ghost comes down to sanctify the oblation that will be, become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So that action is done. So remember that altar boys who ring the bell at that time, Remember, that's Christ taking on all our sins, being laid on him, and then he's driven outside the western gate of Jerusalem to die. And this is fulfilled on Good Friday. The lamb, the scapegoat for our sins, is driven out the western gate to die outside the gate in Calvary. Here's what St. Vincent Ferrer says, And because the Jews had so weakened him with punches and blows, strokes and mockeries, not to mention the scourging and the crowning, he was not able to carry the cross very long or very far, because he was totally spent and exhausted. So he fell under the cross. No wonder from the bloodshed from all his veins, which flowed from the wounds of the scourging and thorns, and the immensity of the cross, which was fifteen feet high and ten feet across. So you get a a two-by-six board sh shaped like that, that's not light. But this was not a two-by-six. This was a, a square piece of wood, probably five-by-five five or six-by-six, six, so it was heavy. Going out to the place they call Calvary, as he was being led there, he found he could not continue. And this is when they recruited Simon the Cyrenian. So all the falls of our Lord, again, are violent. Every step of the way is just excruciating pain. And as he falls, remember the crown of thorns. His head is sandwiched between the velocity of the weight of the cross coming in and sandwiching his head as he hits the ground. And then all the thorns go deeper into his skull, piercing into the bone and causing much more bloodshed. And I argue, and I think it's medically accurate, a normal man would, be, would go unconscious it's so violent and it's so rough. I mean, as I, I say again, there are hockey players with two-inch thick helmets and football players that get knocked out and they've got helmets and padding and protection. So Christ, who had no helmet, his helmet was piercing thorns, he would have easily been knocked out. But this proves again he's God because he's not going to be knocked out. He's not going to pass out because he's going to drink this chalice to the end for our redemption. So, Mary, the Virgin Mary, was in Bethany. And it was, she understood from St. John that our Lord was arrested. And here's what St. Vincent Ferrer says. Our Lady never did anything indecent to her modesty or deflecting from her virginity. Nor is that fable true, by which the wicked would seem to injure the glorious virgin, which says that the virgin Mary ran here and there from house to house like a hysterical woman to where Christ was being taken, and as a sign of her anxiety she tore her hair out, peering through windows, wringing her hands and wailing pitifully. And St. Vincent Ferris says this is, this is all old wives' tales, it's not true. There are many other such tales all of which are false and frivolous. The reason for this, otherwise many women would have been more perfect than the Virgin Mary, namely St. Sophronia, Sophronia and her seven sons, the mother of the seven martyrs, and many others. But since there are three manners of weeping, some express excessive sorrow in exterior works, some let out cries of pain, and some the bitter taste of sorrow in the heart. And this was Our Lady. So the Virgin Mary discovered the third way of sorrow, which was bitter taste of sorrow in, sorrow in her heart. She did nothing wrong or indecent, neither forgetting her Catholic faith and virginal modesty. In her alone remained the faith in the resurrection of her son. 
So Our, Our Lady always had a noble, majestic, feminine, motherly bearing and a supernatural glow about her. So she moderated the incomparable pain and she did nothing that was undisciplined. Origen, in a sermon on the Passion, says, All the pain conceived in the Virgin Mary by the Passion of Christ, she so kept within the cloister of her soul that neither excessive impatience or exterior sign of something inordinate came out from her, unless so far as a flow of tears from her maternal eyes which revealed her crushing anxiety. Hence she had the maximum compassion with Christ. And then let me draw to a close with another interesting point brought up by St. Vincent Ferrer. St. Bernard describes the lamentable procession, saying, When Christ was led forth carrying the cross, there was a crowd of people following him, just as when thieves and malefactors are led to death. Some went laughing, others mocking, others throwing dirt on him. Looking up, our Lord sees the yoke laid on his shoulders, pressing heavily on him. Looking behind, he sees his mother and the great crowd of people and of women who follow, who wept and lamented him out of their great compassion. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, because I freely choose to die, and because of the divine plan which ordains that I die in this way, and because of the usefulness of my death, that by dying I destroy death. Our Lord commands them to weep for past and future sins, the cause of the passion which makes Christ suffer in the order of justice. It is necessary that he suffers these sorrows for our salvation. Thus, Christ says to the weeping women, Weep for yourselves and for your children, for behold, the day shall come, wherein they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that have not borne, and the breasts that have not nursed. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall upon us, and to the hills, Cover us. So that's St. Luke chapter 23. He records that Christ speaking to the women, weeping over him. So what's the meaning of these words? Let's look into it with St. Vincent Ferrer. He says, Christ was speaking of the assault of the Romans by Titus and Emperor Vespasian, princes of Jerusalem in the 42nd year after the ascension of our Lord, which was 70 AD, destroying Jerusalem, raising it to the ground, when so great a slaughter occurred that the blood of those killed flowed like a river through all parts of the city. And the city was taken on the day of Passover, and all the Jewish officials were killed. And thirty were sold for one denarius. And in the siege of the city, one million one hundred thousand died from famine and the sword, and eighty thousand Jews sold to slavery or dispersed. And so was brought to truth and verified that curse which they had said to Pilate, His blood be upon us and on our children. Christ wept for that disaster on Palm Sunday. The famine was such at the time of the siege that mothers were eating their own children, as Josephus records, who was actually there, although he had hidden in the clefts of the rocks until the persecution ceased. So our Lord says, don't weep for me, but for your children, because it's their children that are going to be killed under the Romans. Jesus was also speaking of the final judgment, when out of fear they begin to say to the mountains, fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For he adds the clause, for if in the green wood they do these things, that is, in me, Christ is said to be green wood, because he is green in the root of his div divinity, he is green in the stem of his humanity, he is green in the branches of his virtues, he is green in the leaves of his words, he is green in the fruits of good works. In the dry, that is, the sin which lacks the moisture of grace, the fruit of justice, the healthy growth of constancy, in the dry, what shall be done, asked Christ. That is, how much punishment do you think they deserve? The compassion of his mother and the women are clear from this. 
So when Christ says to the women weeping, don't weep for me. And if they do this when it's green, that is with Christ, what are they going to do when it's dry? And when the, when the Romans hit Jerusalem, it was a terrible punishment for the deicide. So, and then our Lord is, comes to the top of Calvary, and he is again stripped of his tunic, stripped, stripped of his garments, and again, all the wounds are reopened. And when they tear off his garment, also comes the crown of thorns, or a lot of it falls off. So what do they do? They recrown him. They put it back on and pound it in his head again. Normally, the Roman soldiers had to wrestle with the criminals to, to nail them to the cross. And with our Lord, they strip him, they knock him down, and he's on, he's on the cross, and he willingly extends his arms. And the Roman soldiers are wondering, you know, what's wrong with this guy? It's as if he wants to die. And he does for our salvation. And our Lord willingly stretches out his arms. He is nailed through on the right arm through the median nerve which the Romans would there's a bone here that would, would not rip out as, as it would if it was in the palm so he was nailed right through the median nerve and the shock of that would feel like fire through all your veins, all fire through all your body and this is what our Lord felt constantly on the cross, this burning fire and shock right through his body constantly because his whole, that whole nerve was weighing on the nail the entire time on the cross. Again, a normal man couldn't take it. A normal man would just pass out. But our Lord, um, he loves his Father and he loves souls too much. And so they nail him in the other hand. One, one theory suggests that because the hole was too wide, they had to pull his arm and yank it and dislocate his shoulder. And it still wasn't wide enough to go into the hole that was pre-dug. Pre so they couldn't reach the wrist to the hole, so they just pounded the nail through the hand and then tied it with ropes. And there are relics of those ropes of the Passion. Uh, there are, they are kept, I think, in... I think St. Vincent Ferrer mentions it. They were kept in France. So that explains the stigmata of St. Francis of Assisi, Padre Pio, Teresa Newman, Little Rose, uh, that had the, the wound in the hand. Because if it was through the wrist, they could, it would kill them. They couldn't take that pain. So it was a little more merciful through the hand. And then St. Robert Bellarmine says they pounded uh, two nails in Christ's feet. St. Bridget says they put the feet on top of each other and pounded two nails through, resting on a little, a little uh, footrest. And St. Robert Bellarmine argues that it was two separate feet that were nailed to the cross. So, all right, you might argue over this, but whether it's on top of each other or separate, it's just as painful, just as tremendously painful. And so our Lord is hanging on the cross now, and for three hours, you know, this, we, could go, we could go on for another three hours, but to tie this up, because we're going to start the devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, to tie all this up, our Lord is hanging on the cross and he preaches the seven words, the most powerful seven sermons that he gives. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I thirst. No, the second word is this. He says to the good thief, thou shalt be with me today in paradise. So he canonizes by baptism of desire this <clears throat> penitent sinner. Third, he, our Lord says, I thirst. I thirst. Now, some used to say that the sponge dipped into the vinegar and myrrh had a delirium effect on the, pay, on the criminal so that it would kind of ease their pain. But our, but our Lord didn't drink it because he, he would not take a painkiller for our redemption. And I knew a man who was dying of cancer. He had lumps all over him. And he was a good Catholic man out in Missouri. And he would not take the painkillers during the day. He would suffer, deliberately suffer for his children, for souls. 
And that night he would take the painkiller so he could sleep. But this is what our Lord did. So, uh, and then the fourth word, he says to St. John, Behold your mother, woman, behold your son. And he gives his greatest treasure to us after he gives everything to us. And then our Lord shouts out in a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, roaring the high priest and victim, roaring the victory of the cross. And his soul leaves the body and goes immediately to limbo to rip open the gates of limbo, like Samson ripped open the gates and tore out the walls and the gates from the city of Gaza and carried it up the hill and threw it down. This is what Christ did at his resurrection. So, uh, let me just close with one last point, which is, when Christ dies, they, they pierce open his sacred heart, out gushes blood and water, and then our Lord is taken down from the cross by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus in St. John, and our Lord's body is placed in the arms of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And this scene is extremely powerful. It's called the Pieta. It's the Pieta. But Our Lady is holding her son that she held in Bethlehem, that she held as a baby. She saw him grow up in Egypt. She embraced him. She kissed him. She loved him. And Our Lord loved her with a supernatural love as well as a human love. And now she, she's holding our work. What have I done to our Lord? That's what I did. And we pierce the heart of Mary this way. So let's console the Mother of God. Let's make reparation. And we'll begin now the devotions of the sorrows of Our Lady. We'll just go right into it. If any of you need to have a bathroom break or whatever, go ahead. But we'll just start. And after the devotions, we'll end the, the events of today of Good Friday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We meditate now on the seventh sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious Advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us, and after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Represent to your mind the pious disciples embalming the body of our Lord, carrying it to the tomb which was in the garden of Joseph of Arimathea, and closing the tomb with a huge stone. So right now, this Good Friday of 2022, it's about 310. So this is about the time when our Lord is hanging on the cross and they strike the spear through his sacred heart. And it won't be much longer. By 5 p.m. he's already buried. First point. In the fifth sorrow, Mary lost the soul of Jesus, which went into limbo to bring light and joy to the fathers, who rested in the bosom of Abraham. But his body remained in her arms at the foot of the cross. In this seventh sorrow of Our Lady, even this will be taken away from her, in order that she might be brought down to that sad loneliness which constitutes desolation. The shades of evening were falling fast. She must rise and give up the sacred body of our Lord to the devout disciples, that they may put the winding sheet around it, the shroud, and carry it to the tomb. There was not a shadow of selfishness in Mary. It was her lot to suffer and she did not tarry a moment longer than it behooved, but gave up her precious treasure with as much promptness as she had done to the Eternal Father on the day of her purification. 
Many offices were to be rendered to that body before its internment, for which no better hands could be employed than hers. It was to be anointed and embalmed according to the custom of the nation. His hair and limbs were to be composed as well as could be done. Each wound of his body was to be dressed with precious spices, and his face was to be covered with a handkerchief. Mary had all rights to do all this, and nobody could have done it with greater devotion and love than she. But she willingly yields up her maternal rights and gives in to the piety of St. John, St. Joseph of Arimathea, and the, and the others who all put their hands to the task. Two loves were conflicting in her heart. The love of Jesus prompted her to exercise those offices of piety towards his body with her own hands. And the love of men urged her to give up the privilege to the devout disciples. The love of men prevailed. She had learned this from Jesus, who not only gave all himself, but even his mother to mankind. Th though the sacrifice cost her a great grief, Mary did it most willingly. Learn from this tender mother the important lesson that where the love of Jesus reigns uppermost, all love of self must disappear. There were open brackets. There were some studies done on the shroud, and they have found on the shroud stains as it were on a tablecloth with wine stains on the bottom of the, the cups. And some speculate that the, the first altar cloth that Christ said the first Mass on was actually the cloth of the shroud that wrapped his body. So again, we have that intimate connection between the Mass and the sacrifice of Christ. And when the priest at the end of Mass, you, you always notice there's that time where he's cleaning the chalice, cleaning the, purifying the ciborium, and then puts the ciborium that still has consecrated host back into the tabernacle. And then he shuts the door and locks it. And all this is mindful of Christ's body being wrapped into the and buried in the sepulchre and the stone locking it, shutting it. So this ties in with the Mass. In honor of our, the tears of Our Lady, three Hail Marys. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. The second point. Now the procession begins. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and St. John, with greatest reverence, carry the body of our Lord. Mary walks on one side near the head of Christ. St. Mary Magdalene holds her favorite place near the feet, and the others follow behind. The greatest stillness reigns all over. Not a sound is heard except that of the footsteps and of the sobs of those mourning. Slowly they advanced towards the garden which belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, not far from the top of Calvary. This nobleman had hewn in the rock a sepulcher for himself. It was here where Jesus was to be buried. Having arrived at his, at his spot, Mary made her sacrifice, and Jesus was placed in the tomb. Thus nothing was left to her but that which she could not part with and would not have parted with, if she could, a broken heart utterly submerged in a sea of sorrow. Joseph, as St. Matthew tells us, rolled a great stone to the door of the monument, and Mary fell on her knees and adored Jesus in the tomb. The nearest resemblance of the tabernacle on our altars. She was now widowed and orphaned as none else was before. What are father and mother and husband and child to an incarnate God? 
And could she not remain by that tomb until that happy morning of his resurrection? Who could deny such a mother this only and too just a comfort? No, her detachment, her bereavement must be like that of her son, complete. A band of soldiers sent by the Jews come and take possession of the tomb and of the garden, ordering away anyone else who was in any way connected with Jesus. Mary was obliged to leave and leave her treasure again in the hands of sinners and unbelievers. O oh Mary, thy sorrow has no comparison. Jesus has become our property, the property of us poor sinners. Once and again thou hast given up thy maternal rights in behalf of sinners. Behold, now thy offering is complete to its fullness. Jesus is ours, all ours. We thank thee, O sorrowful mother, for thy gift. Three Hail Marys in honor of the tears of Our Lady on Good Friday. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. The third point. In order to understand the agony which our Blessed Lady suffered in this sadness and dolor of the seventh sorrow, we must take several circumstances into consideration. Her long fast told grievously upon her strength. No food had crossed her lips since the evening before. No sleep had visited her eyelids on the Thursday night, and there was little hope of her sleeping now while Jesus lay in the tomb. Moreover, the twenty-four hours had been filled with the most astonishing events. Her soul had been on the rack of extreme torture the whole time. Her mind had been stretched and fatigued incessantly by what was going on around her. Her nature had been shaken by terror. She was worn out by the bodily fatigue of standing so many hours. In such unutterably woeful plight, it was, it was that the streets of Jerusalem beheld their unknown queen that night, wending her weary way to the house of St. John. This was, the, this was the home she had received in exchange for the house of Nazareth. John is her son now, instead of Jesus. As Jesus now belongs to others, so has the mother become the property of mankind. The door closed upon her. She was now at home. Home? How could she have a home except where Jesus was? But this is the home of her new motherhood. Her grief, meanwhile, remained preternaturally at its height because it was beyond the reach of use and time. None could comfort it but God, and his time had not come yet. Such was the mystery of the seventh sorrow. So our Blessed Mother, on Good Friday night, she never slept. She would hear all night the pounding of the nails, the thud of the falls of the cross. She would hear the blasphemies, the mockeries, the, the hypocrisy, hypocrisy of the high priests and Pharisees mocking Christ on the cross, throwing rocks, throwing dirt at him. And uh, the piercing of the heart of Jesus that pierced her heart. So Our Lady never slept on Good Friday night. And all Saturday morning she rose and went with St. John and walked through the entire way of the cross. So Our Lady is the first to teach us this devotion of the stations of the cross. And she arrives on Calvary again, and she still sees the blood stains that she orders the angels to gather. And Our Blessed Mother, Saturday evening, maybe the apostles 
convince her to take some nourishment, some refreshment, and Our Lady falls asleep Saturday night. And at 3 o'clock on Easter morning, her cell, her room is filled with a brilliant light, and she sees, she's wakened up by the singing of angels, and she opens her eyes and she sees the resurrected body of Christ the King, our Lord, the Lamb of God, triumphant over death. And she immediately wakes up and falls to her knees and embraces her divine Son. And our Lord lifts up this wilted flower that had been crushed from the hurricane of three days of storm. Our Lady is flat on the ground with sorrow. And here our Lord picks up his divine mother and consoles her with a joy, indescribable joy. And some of the fathers of the church say that Christ then brought with him some of the saints from limbo. So the Virgin Mary met Moses. She met St. David. She met Isaiah, the prophet, who foretold the virgin who would bear a son. And our Lord introduced her to these great prophets and kings and saints of the Old Testament. And perhaps, it doesn't say it, but perhaps St. Joseph also was there. So let's honor the Blessed Virgin Mary and her great sorrows on this Good Friday. Console the Mother of God and pull out some thorns from her Immaculate Heart because all sin offends God and all sins offend, offends her. So we'll close with the prayer of the seven Hail Marys. And then we'll close finally with the hymn to Christ crowned with thorns, O sacred head surrounded. The seven Hail Marys. In honor of Our Lady, her first sorrow, the prophecy of Simeon, that a sword of sorrow would pierce her heart. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The flight into Egypt. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The loss of the child Jesus for three days in Jerusalem. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The meeting of Christ carrying the cross, crowned with thorns, dripping with blood, at the meeting on the fourth station of the cross. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Our Lady at the foot of the cross hears the panting for air of her divine Son trying to breathe in a suffocating position. She hears his seven words and she sees him die. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and And the body of Jesus taken down from the cross, is laid in her arms. And the arms of Jesus cannot be folded because the rigor mortis set in. His arms are wide open to show, even in his death, his heart is open for all souls and, and sinners to come to the sacred heart of Jesus, to be forgiven, to obtain heaven through his mercy. Mary holds the body of Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And the seventh sorrow, the burial of Christ in the tomb. When Mary, she sees his body wrapped in the shroud, and she adores the divinity of Christ in his body. Christ, his divinity was both in the body and in his soul, in limbo. So right now, it's 3.30-ish, Christ would be dead, his soul would be in this, with the saints of limbo, bringing them great joy, and they would be seeing his soul. So St. Vincent Ferris says, when you, when you cut an apple in half, 
you've got the, the red skin and the white part on both halves. So the divinity is like the white part. It was in both halves, in the body of Christ in the tomb and in the soul of Christ in the limbo. But it was the divinity present in both. So in honor of the burial of our Lord and Our Lady's seventh sorrow, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual life shine upon them. And may the souls and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. O sacred head surrounded by crown of piercing thorns, all bleeding head so wounded, reviled and poor to scorn. <coughs> <coughs> Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendas de vos, Emmanuel Semper. Amen. <laughs>